All right, so Psalm 69, and we're going to be in verse 1. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 8 this morning. But first, let's pray. Our God and our Father, again, Lord, I do thank you for this time now with your word. I pray, Lord, that we would remember that your word is from you, that you inspired holy men to write it, and that your word has stood strong all these years, despite those that mock it and mock you and mock your son, Jesus Christ. Your word is still true. And it's truer than any truth that this world may provide. That your word will stand strong and will endure to the very end and beyond. And Lord, I pray that this time now would bless you. I pray, Lord, that it would be your word that shines forth and casts that light on the shadows of our heart. I pray, Lord, that it would be your word that comforts and convicts whatever we need this day. And I pray, Lord, that we would just remember to always trust in your Son, Jesus Christ remembering what he has done for us on the cross, paying the wages of my sin, the debt of my sin with his blood, that he lay dead in the tomb, and then on the third day he arose from the dead, and that Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. Lord, we thank you for that good news. I pray, Lord, that you would drive us to share it with others. And this I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so Psalm 69, verse 1. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire, where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters, where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dry. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. O God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Because for thy sake I have borne reproach. Shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, and an alien unto my mother's children. Now Psalm 69 is a psalm of pain and anguish at first. And there are days that seem dark and dismal with little hope in sight. And there are days that seem like what is the point of going on and yet you continue into another day. But each day seems bleak and the future does not seem to hold much hope. That is the state that David is in as we read the beginning here of Psalm 69. Now David was a man after God's own heart, and still his circumstances could seem dire, and David sorrowed over his situation. And situations can seem bleak, and as Psalm 69 opens, David's state seems to be quite low. Look again at verse 1. Save me, O God, for the waters are come into my, in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. Now picture for a moment walking out into the ocean and walking out so far that your feet barely touch the bottom and then to where you are actually just kind of floating in place but not treading water. As the ocean waves roll in, you are only just able to keep your face above water, and even then, it is a struggle. The waves do not stop, and the waters just feel deeper and deeper as they wash over you. Now remember, your feet are just above the floor of the ocean, 
And when they do touch down, they feel like they are going to sink and not stop. Between the waves and the mire of the ocean floor, you are unsure if you're going to make it. You have no firm ground to stand upon as you keep bobbing up and down in the turbulent waters. And you are all alone in the waters. Now David records that the waters have come into his soul, much like a boat in the middle of the ocean that develops a leak. The troubles have flooded David's soul, and they are overwhelming. And what is David to do at this point? He feels like he can't go anywhere. He's got nowhere to look to. In Proverbs 18, 14 tells us, The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear? For a time, a person can bear up under tribulations and endure and carry on. But what happens when the soul is flooded and the spirit is wounded? A person can take advice from the world's experts, and they will prescribe drugs, and they will prescribe therapies, and they will recommend this program or that system. But will any of those things help a wounded spirit? No. Those things will seem to work for a while, but eventually they will fail. When we took our last trip, just this week, we brought along an air mattress for our youngest to sleep on. And it was bedtime when we plugged in the motor. It was one of those air mattresses that, you know, we plug it in and it blows itself up. We plugged it in and it blew up and, and, and seemed to be doing well for a while. However, we discovered that it had a hole in it. And we had not brought along a patch to be able to repair the hole, and so we had to improvise. First, we had to find the hole, which we did, and then after we found the hole, we borrowed some duct tape from the people we were staying with, and I put several pieces thick of duct tape over the hole. And that seemed to work until 1 a.m., when our daughter found herself sinking in the, in the bed again. The duct tape did not hold, and she valiantly tried adding more tape, but air kept escaping from the bed. The duct tape had provided immediate relief. It kept her up for a few hours, but in the end, it did not hold up. And the same result is found with the use of drugs and the world's experts' advice and programs and systems. They may have a short-term effect on the problem, but they will fail in the end. The world's solutions will not bear up a wounded spirit. They may patch a hole for a time, but they are not the proper patch. With the correct patch, the hole, the problem can be fixed. And the correct patch is, of course, Jesus Christ. Psalm 69, verse 3. <clears throat> verse 3, I am weary of my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. At this point, David has cried, and he has cried, <clears throat> and he has nothing left in him. His throat is dry, and he cannot cry another tear. He is waiting on God, and he is waiting on God, and waiting on God for relief. And David has called out to God, save me, O God, but he still languishes in the deep waters. David is exhausted from crying out to God. He thought God would swoop in and save him immediately from his troubles, but God is not. His eyes are straining to see God in action helping him, and God is not in sight. His throat is parched from calling out to God for deliverance, and God is not answered. David is almost without hope at this point. However, please note that David has not, has not stopped crying out to God. He opened the psalm with, Save me, O God, after all. David continues to feel like the drowning man going down under the waters many times, 
but he continues to cry out to God. Proverbs 18, 14 again says, The spirit of a man shall sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear? Who can bear a wounded spirit? Only Jesus Christ can. Through his, though his throat is parched from calling to God, even though his eyes are exhausted from tears and looking for God, David still knows that God is the only one that can bear a wounded spirit. Verse 4. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. Now David has more enemies than he can count at this point. These enemies hate him, and David states that they have really no reason to hate him. What had David done to his enemies? We don't know. They are ready to destroy him, and they are many, and they are mighty. What has David done to be hated so? David tells God that his enemies have no good reason to hate him. The enemies have hated him without a cause. They are David's enemies when there is no good reason for them to be enemies. And you too may have enemies that hate you for no known reason. And that is better than having enemies because you gave them a reason to be your enemy. Consider your words and consider your actions as you relate to others. Believers on Jesus Christ are to be peaceable with others and not seek to give people reason to hate you. This world is unjust, and people will not behave as you expect, and too often you may cry out, that's not fair. It does not matter if it's fair. Do not expect things to be fair if you are a believer on Jesus Christ, because the world will not treat you fairly. And because the world will not behave fairly, do not use that as an excuse to retaliate or fight back against them. Your enemies are powerful, and they may be many, and they may lie about you, and they will get others to turn against you. Let them. Let them. Do not expect things to be fair. The wiles of the devil are many, and he will influence many against you. Ephesians 6.12 tells us, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You may not have done anything to deserve the treatment others will give you. And you know what? You will need to still bear the pain. Why? Because you are a witness for Jesus Christ. Even David said, Then I restored that which I took not away. His enemies claimed that he had taken something from them, and David made reparations even though he was not guilty of the accused crime. It may cost you dearly, but doing the right thing is always best in the long run. And that may mean that you will have to pay back something that you never took in the first place. That may mean that you will have to say, I'm sorry, when there wasn't necessarily anything to apologize for. It may mean that you will have to humble yourself before people that, that would just as soon lord it over you and act proudfully against you. That's what Jesus Christ did. And think about that. Jesus Christ, the creator of all things, humbled himself before his creation as he stood before Pilate, as he stood before the, the, the Pharisees, after they whipped him and scourged him, nailed him to a tree that was of his own creation. He was willing to humble himself for all of that. Even as he hung on the cross and, and the Pharisees are there before him, sitting before him, mocking him and reviling him, he still hung there on the cross and said, Father, forgive them. He still humbled himself before those that didn't deserve it. 
But he did it because he loved them. He did it for them. It may cost you dearly, but doing the right thing is always best in the long run. Psalm 69, verse 5. O God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame have covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. <clears throat> and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was too my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. They that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. Is it any wonder why David was so low at this point? This passage was a difficult passage. In verse 5, David acknowledges that he is a sinful man. How often do you acknowledge your sins? How often do you blame your sins on others? If this person had not said such and such, then I would not have reacted that way. Or if this person had not done such and such, then I would not have done this. Or if that person had done such and such, then I would not have done this. How others behave, what others say, is not an excuse for your own sin. How others do not behave, and what others did not say, but you feel they should have, is still not an excuse for your own sin. Your sins are of your own choosing, plain and simple. In verses 6 and 7 here, David states that he does not want to be a stumbling block to others. And if you remain humble and bow down to God and what he tells you in the Bible, then you will not be a stumbling block to others. To be a believer on Jesus Christ, you will receive reproach from others that you do not necessarily deserve. However, because you are a Christian, you will still receive mockings and shamings from others. Why? Because those people hate God. You will lose friends because those people hate God and they hated him long before they hated you. People are going to look at you like you're a stranger. Why? Because now to them, you are. In, first, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You are supposed to be different. If you are continuing to be in sin, God does not care how many coffee mugs you own with Bible verses on them. If you are continuing in sin and have no repentance, you are likely not a new creature. If you are in Christ, then you are going to bear reproach. You're going to be a stranger unto your own brethren and an alien unto your mother's children. They're going to look at you like they've never known you. They're going to look at you like... You're nothing to them. And that can hurt. That can hurt. Do you want to serve man? Or do you want to serve God? And the reproaches, the scorn and contempt you will receive from those that you thought were closest to you will hurt and sting. And the words of hate toward God will be the words spoken toward you as well. Are those around you godly? No? Then you need a new circle of friends. Those friends will turn on you in a moment if it works to their advantage. And yes, as a believer on Jesus Christ, there will be those that turn on you, and some of them will be your closest friends and relatives. 
you must be willing to bear their reproach and scorn and remember that they first reproached and scorned Jesus Christ. Verse 10. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was too my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. They that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. You know what? It hurts to have your family tell you to say grace quickly or else the food will get cold. It hurts to have family not understand why you set aside time on Sunday to worship God with others. God is important to me. And David is telling us that he mourned and he fasted and wept toward God and his friends, his brethren, and his siblings mocked him for it. But David still did the right thing. David wept and made sackcloth his garment, and those that sat all day at the city gate just talked with each other about how foolish David was. Never mind that they are the ones sitting at the gate foolishly drinking alcohol and making fools of themselves. They compound the foolishness by mocking David, and worse yet, by mocking God in song. Following God was important to David, and it must be important to you. Following God will not make you popular. It will have instead the opposite effect. And being mocked and reproached and scorned and hated by people that were your friends, that hurts. It stings, and it can be overwhelming. But remember, Jesus Christ is a closer friend. Jesus Christ endured worse than you have, and he still asked God the Father to forgive them. Are you willing to do the same? Verse 13. <clears throat> but as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Even though David's brethren relatives, and neighbors scorned him, he still determined to do what was right in God's eyes. Even though it may cost him everything he may hold dear, David determined that he holds God even dearer. Is it better to love God or man first? David understood that it is better to love God first, and most, and always. And people will question you, why are you doing that? Why are you carrying your Bible? Why are you reading your Bible? When I was a lost person, I admit, I enjoyed sleeping in on Sundays and then reading the newspaper. But now I want to be here. People may look at me strangely. People may mock me for it. And I have had both. But it is always better to obey God despite people mocking me than it is to disobey God to make people stop mocking me. Verse 13. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time. In the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me, and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, Neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Now remember, this psalm began with David speaking about being overwhelmed and flooded in his soul, that he was in the mire and in danger of going down a last time. And there will be days that can seem that way. And it is possible to get very low in mood and attitude. And anxiety and sadness can build up and overwhelm the soul. But what you need to remember when those days come is that you are not alone. And people do care about you. You may think nobody cares about you. People do care about you. At the very least, I care about you. Everyone else cares about you. 
And even more importantly than all of these people, God does care about you. You need to go to him. And David does that, just does just that again in verses 13 through 15. The day can seem very dark and dreary and no end in sight, but there is always another tomorrow. Are you looking to God as you should? The Lord God of heaven is your Lord, whether you acknowledge that or not. And Jesus Christ is more than capable to deliver you from the mire and from those that hate you and out of the deep waters. Even if you think that nobody else cares about you, Jesus Christ does care about you. And that's what's so sad with so much of the suicides that are happening today. Because they're, they're, they think nobody cares. And they get so wrapped into themselves, sadly. And, and, and that's all they can see is the next moment. And they can't see any further than that. And yet people that have talked to people that have tried to commit suicide and they failed, thankfully, what have they found when talking to those people? Those people say, I wish I waited 24 more hours. I just waited another day. I waited another day, and, and they would not have ended up attempting it. How sad, though, because people are out there, and they're hurting. We need to show them that we do care, because we do. As believers on Jesus Christ, we're supposed to care. It doesn't matter who the person is. We need to let them know. There's so much pain out there. The way this world is working right now, they're just saying, oh, it's okay because there's nothing on the other side. But there is. There is a heaven. There is a hell. There is Jesus Christ. He is there. And he does care. We have a message of hope that is better than anything Dr. Phil could ever say or Oprah could say or anybody else could say. We have the message of Jesus Christ here in this Bible, and that's what people need to know. They would trust in him and believe on him. That's what they need to know. They need to hear these things because they're true. And they're the best truth that is out there. And even David, is as low as he was feeling at that point, he knew that he needed to look to God in all things. And that's what's so easy to do. We forget sometimes. We, we get so wrapped up in ourselves and, and, and focusing on my pain, my hurt. But Jesus Christ felt all those pains and hurts as well. He was tempted in all ways as we were and yet never sinned. He knows the same pains that we have felt and never sinned. And if we look to him, trusting in him, it's far beyond anything that anybody else can offer out there. And that's where all hope is found, is in Jesus Christ. And that's what we start to see. Go to verse 16. And so we've seen so far, all of this has happened with David. Again, go to verse 16. I'll be there in a second. David has had all this going on. He's barely holding his head up above water. The waves keep rushing in. He's, he's sinking. He's got nothing solid beneath him. And, and he looks around him. His friends have turned on him. His, his parents have turned on him. His siblings have turned on him. Nobody is on his side. But God is on his side. God is on his side. And if there's ever any doubt about that, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The hope is there, and it's Jesus Christ. And that's what David is now reminding himself here in verse 16. Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, and hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw nigh unto my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. God asks David, I'm sorry, David asks God to hear him. 
and a servant of God will be heard by God. And note that David acknowledges that he is a servant of God in verse 17. A servant of God. Yes, David was a king. He was a king over so much of, over, over Israel. He, he had large lands beneath him. He had money. He had all kinds of things. And yet he still realized he was a servant of God first. He didn't say, save me, God, because I'm your king over Israel. No, David realized, I'm a servant of yours. You're the real king of Israel. And that must be your first step. Ask yourself if you are a servant of God. Have you believed on the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you trusted that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the wages of your sin with his death, a death that you deserved and not him? Have you believed that Jesus Christ was buried and that on the third day he arose from the dead? Have you understood that you are a sinner and that you are under the wrath of God, and that without Jesus Christ shed blood to wash away your sins, you have no hope, and you are truly lost. If you have truly believed on Jesus Christ and repented of your sins, then you must understand that days can be bleak, but there is always hope in Jesus Christ. Continue to cry out to him. Do not just throw up your hands and give up. There is always a tomorrow. Look to him for deliverance. And at the same time, though, have you examined yourself and see if there is any unconfessed sin in your life? The bleakness in your life may be caused by your own sin. And sin will always take you further than you ever expected. And sin will always cost you more than you ever expected. And sin will always take you further from God than you ever thought possible. And that sin will gnaw at your soul. And that sin, as little, little as you may think it to be, it's immense before God. You must repent of the sin and seek God's forgiveness before you can expect that he will deliver you. You must look to him and believe on Jesus Christ before you can expect that he will deliver you. God is there and he hears his children. Trust in him for all things. And that's what David was doing. He continued to cry out to God. And that's what we've seen as we've gone through the different psalms. That's the Psalms of pain that David has had. I keep thinking back to again like a month ago when we did Psalm 88 and such a sad psalm that was. But even through all of that and as low as David was, he cried out to God three times in Psalm 88. Because he knew that's where his hope is, is in God, not in self, not in my wife, not in my children, not in my parents, not in the President of the United States, not in anybody running against him, not in the Congress, New York State Legislature. My hope is in Jesus Christ and him alone. Because all those other things will not save my soul. All those other things can do nothing about my sin. Only Jesus Christ can. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So we have a message of comfort that we can give to others. And others are hurting out there. They need that message of comfort. And it's only going to come from Christ. It isn't going to come from anything of this world. They need something more than that. And that's Jesus Christ. And let's pray. Our God and our Father, I thank you again, Lord, for this time with your word. Thank you, Lord, for Psalm 69, 
in the fact that we see David, even as low as he is, still looking to Jesus Christ, still crying out to you, Lord, knowing that his hope and his salvation is only in you. Lord, that's the message we need to remember every day. And that's the message we need to share with others. This world is so hurting. People are looking for peace and relief from the pain in all kinds of ways. But none of those ways will work except through Jesus Christ. Lord, that's the message of hope we have for others. And I pray, Lord, that we would be your ministers to others to let them know about salvation from him and him alone. God, I pray as we go through this week now, we would daily seek your wisdom and ask you for it and you give it to us liberally. And I thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, that we would remember who we are in you as we interact with others throughout this week. And this I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.